Hey, good morning, everybody. Uh, we're going to start here in a few minutes. We're refining the process on how this all works. So if you see me staring uh, blankly at something, uh, it's because of the way the cameras are or uh, how we're trying to record this. So like I said, it's a, it's a process that uh, uh, we're refining as we go along. We're new to this. So uh, please ask you to, to um, give us a little uh, help if you got suggestions on something. We are gonna change the camera angles here uh, on some upcoming videos because uh, obviously uh, you guys are either looking up my nose or uh, something's not right. We're also trying to get uh, uh, the settings correct where when somebody joins, you'll see me looking over, when somebody's in the waiting room to come in that they automatically join. I guess there were some people that uh, wanted to come into the last meeting that I wasn't able to get in because I wasn't looking over to see if people are waiting to join. And I haven't been able to find an auto join function yet. So um, we'll, we'll continue on with that. But uh, it's 10 o'clock, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Brent Palmer. I am, I am with uh, CRT Services, and we are based in Humble, Texas. And what we're doing is we are starting a video series on uh, measurement. And uh, measurement is going to encompass pretty much a lot of different uh, categories. And for this video series, we're trying to uh, capture just as much as we possibly can across all the different technologies and disciplines within measurement to be able to present this information uh, logically on video. Every, you know, if anybody else works, looks at YouTube to do just about anything around the house before they do it, uh, I'm one of those people. So uh, we just really, uh, I enjoy videos. Uh, learning how to do something as long as they're broken down they're logical and they're short who wants to watch a, a, a five-hour video on how to do something when uh, you know you can you can watch it for five minutes and, and understand the basic concept so these videos are going to be between 15 minutes and 30 minutes long so when we do these we're going to try to uh, keep them as short as possible but also as informative as possible and as always if you have any suggestions or anything on on some videos that you'd like to see or would like to participate if you're uh, consider yourself a subject matter expert or knowledgeable in something, you've got uh, some good skills that you want to help share along, hey, uh, we would love to get with you on, on hosting one of these and uh, getting you all set up to do that and uh, sharing your knowledge. We, uh, we are never going to charge for this information. It's uh, when, when we're done, I'll have these videos posted up online and they'll be in YouTube. You can share with anybody. We'll go into some specific manufacturing equipment and uh, it's not meant to be as a, a sales event for the equipment. It's meant to be how do we use the equipment. Uh, with CRT, we, we use a lot of different equipment and uh, we have to be familiar with a lot of different things and every piece of equipment has some, uh, some nuances to it. What we're covering now is uh, liquid and mass calculations. So um, that's what today's class is gonna be about and it's just gonna go over what are the basics, what am I trying to get out of a flow computer and uh, when I've got this uh, uh, flow computer sitting out there, what do the numbers mean? Where do they come from? How do I derive them? So first of all, uh, obviously safety is our number one concern. So if, uh, if, if, you're, if you're having any issues, please get a hold of 911 because uh, in video conferencing, we really don't know where you're gonna be at. Number two is that uh, get up and stretch. One of the worst things that they, they say you can do now is sit around. I, I do it working all day. Um, but I do try to get up and, and, and move around. And number three, obviously, in the crazy environment that we're in today, uh, make sure you're eating healthy, drinking lots of uh, fluids. And uh, if you feel like you're coming down with something, please, please, please get a hold of a medical professional and uh, um, they'll be able to help you out. I apologize, I'm casting from home. I'm in a little bit of a, a self-quarantine. Uh, we did have somebody uh, that we were visiting that is starting to get ill but we're not sure if it's the, uh, the virus or not. So we're just taking some precautions. And as you can see that we're looking out the, uh, the back porch of my, my house right now um, uh, to my ocean view because I live on the beach. Uh, no, I, uh, you actually hear the lawnmower going by, the guy who lives next door to me. He's picked the perfect time to do his lawn. So uh, I apologize for the noise that's coming in. Um, hopefully they'll be done soon. So um, as we're going along, I do have a little uh, question here. Let's see what's what somebody wrote. Oh, great breakdown. Thanks. Thanks, Tim. I appreciate that. 
Uh, you'll see that I'm going to be in space and some other backgrounds in, in coming up. But uh, if you have any questions about uh, any of the topics that we're going to discuss, please get a hold of us at uh, CRT and uh, we will uh, try to answer them or put you in touch with an industry professional that we know of that can uh, help answer those questions. So again, it's about uh, sharing knowledge and, and that's what we're trying to focus on on these classes. So if I need to repeat one or I need to re-record a session, I'll do that if the audio quality isn't, isn't that, that good. So let's start off liquid and mass calculations. And we are gonna go into the, uh, to the, the bones, bare bones of, of liquid and mass calculations. And again, this is meant to be, we're in measurement. Uh, measurement is my life, uh, my profession. But if I don't understand where these numbers actually are derived from, I can ticket people, I can and share billing information, but if I don't understand in troubleshooting where the number comes from and what the numbers mean, it's really, really hard to determine if, if where the problem lies. So we're gonna go over just basic liquid and mass calculations. And um, you'll hear some terminology that is common across the industry. Sometimes manufacturers may have a little bit of specific information or a little bit of specific terminology that they use. But in general, um, we're gonna try to, try to keep this generalized on, on the information. So with liquid and mass calculations, um, we've got uh, a liquid pulse. And, and basically what I mean by a liquid pulse is we have a meter out there. And it doesn't matter the type of meter. It doesn't matter whether it's a PD meter, whether it's a turbine meter, whether it's an ultrasonic meter, whether it's a Coriolis meter. Most times we are gonna be getting a pulse from this meter that that pulse, excuse me, is gonna equate out to something. So in these pulses, we're gonna start off with trying to determine what the indicated volume is. When I think of indicated, I think of what is the uh, meter indicating to me that that volume is coming across. And to get the indicated volume, what I'm doing is I'm counting the meter pulses and I'm just dividing it by a meter K factor, right? So I have these pulses and what they are is it's an electrical signal that comes into me that has a, a, a square wave typically. And that wave is gonna go above a voltage and below a voltage, and I'm gonna count these. And when I get so many counts, that's gonna equal so much volume, right? That K factor is what's telling me what that volume is. The manufacturer is gonna tell me on the side of a turbine meter or PD meter, how many pulses per unit, the number of pulses per unit to measure, how many pulses am I gonna to get to equal one unit? So, Let's take a little example of this is if I have a meter and it's stamped on the side and it says the K factor is a thousand, it's gonna say a thousand what? A thousand pulses in this case per barrel. So for every thousand square waves that I get in, and when I count that, that's gonna equate out to one barrel. Now some meters are programmable. So the ultrasonic meters, the Coriolis meters, I can set out what that K factor actually is can set it to one pulse per barrel, one pulse per gallon, one pound per barrel, or one pulse per pound, one pulse per thousand pounds, or 10,000 10, pulses. I've done 100,000 pulses per barrel. So you can really kind of set them up to, to what you need, but what you'll find is on the mechanical meters, they already have a K factor. I have so many blades on a turbine. When it spins around so many times, that's gonna give me so many pulses and that number of pulses is gonna to equal to a volume. You may see that the meters are stamped in barrels or gallons. We just have to do a conversion because typically a flow computer has a fixed uh, input of what that pulse input is. Um, in the case of the FlowX flow computers, they're gonna do everything in barrels. So if I have a gallon that's stamped in meters, I just need to uh, do the conversion to convert barrels to meters, or I'm sorry, from gallons to, to barrels. So we do a little math there. So again, this indicated volume is, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna count, and I'm gonna count for a specific period of time. In the case of most flow computers, uh, let's say the Omni, the FlowX, they count every half second. So they're going to accumulate these pulses, and then after a half a second, they're gonna see how many pulses they have. They're gonna divide it by the K factor, and that is gonna come up with how much, what the indicated volume is. And that volume that we're going to reference today is going to be in barrels. If I needed to change that to gallons, again, I would just do a conversion. There's 42 gallons in a barrel. 
I would just multiply the number of barrels I have times 42, and that would be my conversion for gallons. But at its core, I am looking for how many pulses did I get? I divide it by a K factor, and that gives me an indicated volume. A lot of reports and a, a lot of uh, uh, measurement systems, you'll also see that we record the number of pulses that came in during the course of a batch or a period of time. And the reason we do that is if we have to make a correction, let's say that the K factor was wrong at the meter. Somebody put in a wrong K factor for some reason. I can always go back and take those pulses and then um, divide them by the new K factor and come up with a new indicated volume. As long as I count every pulse and as long as I've recorded the number of pulses I had in that batch or that period of time, I can always make a correction later. And you're going to see as we go through these calculations how that becomes important of trying to make these corrections of, of uh, going back and, and knowing different points of my calculation where, where these numbers came from so we can make these corrections and troubleshoot. So, Let's see, I got one more person to admit in here and welcome. So we have our indicated volume. And the next thing I wanna move on to is I need to take that indicated volume and I may have a gross volume. Now some flow computers, they call the, the indicated volume their gross volume. Um, in the flow X, it's actually a separate calculation. And what the gross volume is, is the gross volume, GV, is the indicated volume by the meter factor. And what's a meter factor? Well, a meter factor is a dimensionless term established by proving, proving and used to correct the indicated volume of a meter to its actual metered volume. So what does that all mean? Well, believe it or not, when we get a meter from a company, if it says that it has 2,000 pulses per, per barrel, it may be a little bit off. Why is it a little bit off? installation environment, the effects of the liquid going through it. So we prove meters to actually determine what the volume past that meter or the mass past that meter is. And we do that by proving the meter against a, a calibrated device. Now we can go against a master meter or we can go against a prover, which is a, which is a piece of equipment, many different kinds. We'll have another video series on provers. But we can go against a prover which has a measured section. And basically what we do is we look and we say, okay, I just moved this much volume through a measured section of a, a piece of pipe. And this is how much I counted. The difference between the two will be how I determine what my meter factor is. I, I measured, I say I measured a barrel, but what I actually measured was 0.999 barrels. So I derive a meter factor because I've overmeasured. So therefore, I'm going to create a meter factor that reduces the indicated volume by this meter factor. So, and basically we just take this indicated volume and we multiply it by the meter factor. And that gives us our gross volume. So again, now I'm recording two different volumes inside the flow computer. So I have two different flow rates. I have an indicated volume and I have a gross volume. If somebody implements a wrong meter factor, as long as I have the indicated volume, I can always go back and make a correction to the ticket and recalculate everything from the indicated volume forward if I have a bad meter factor or I need to, to change the meter factor. So this is how we come up with our gross volume. And again, we're building this in a sequential order because we wanna be able to always go back and make a change or a correction or determine where an error took place and make a correction if need be. The same thing that we're doing here is we want to be able to uh, troubleshoot where I may be breaking down in the process. So if I'm looking at a uh, pulses coming in and I, I look at my frequency, I have a, an indication on my meter that tells me what the, what the frequency the meter is giving me is, a hertz, but I don't see an indicated volume, odds are I don't have a, a K factor. My K factor may be zero. Or if I have something that's real wacky, my K factor may be off. Now the same thing is true. If I look at my indicated volume and I'm doing 100 barrels an hour, but my gross volume says I'm doing 50 barrels an hour, pretty much the only thing that's going to affect that is going to be the meter factor. I have a bad meter factor. Somebody may have implemented a bad meter factor or somehow it got changed. So I'm going to go ahead and take a look and see what my meter factor is. Just kind of breaking down where the process is so we can troubleshoot. 
So, oh gosh, I touched my nose. I shouldn't have done that. I apologize. Don't do what I did. So now we've got our gross volume. And what we're going to do is with the gross volume, we're going to move on to our next volume, which is gross standard volume. Now the goal here is we're trying to take our liquids when we do custody transfer, we're trying to take them to base conditions, uh, 60 degrees. We want everything to go back to 60 degrees or standard conditions. So the standard conditions now are gonna be gross standard volume. I wanna take that and I want to get it to standard conditions because I know with all the, with all the, the, uh, with all the experiments and, and all the functionality uh, testing that they've done on these, these tables that we have, we know that at 60 degrees, the product is gonna have this compressibility and it's gonna look like this. So we're trying to get it back to a reference condition when we sell everything through. If I could increase the temperature or decrease the temperature and put it at the same pressure, I am constantly gonna have this same effect and we're gonna move that through and we can sell it a lot easier. Since it doesn't all move that way, we're gonna take it there by looking at some, some, uh, some uh, uh, processes coming in. So to get the gross standard volume, I'm gonna take that gross volume and I'm gonna multiply it by the CTL, CPL, and LCF. CTL, I'm gonna correct for the, the effects of temperature on the liquid. So where do I get those from? The flow computer calculates those through algorithms based upon the ABI table that's selected. And I'm gonna give an example of that here in a little bit. My CPL is the correction factor for the effects of pressure on the liquid. And then my uh, LCF is corrections for the effects of viscosity on the liquid. Viscosity meters have a correction that you can imply on them. Most times what we're looking at is the CTL and CPL to get to our a growth standard volume. Uh, it, it's, I would say you know, it's, it's pretty infrequent that we're using the viscosity corrections, but there are meters out there that do that. But we're gonna keep it simple for this class. So if I build upon this and go back and look at what I just came from, if I have a good indicated volume, good flow rate, if I have a good gross volume, I know that my meter factor is good. Now I'm trying to convert, but my gross standard volume is way off. What affects it? Well, the correction for the temperature of the liquid, the correction for the pressure of the liquid. Where do I get those from? The API table that I use, and that API table relies on temperature and pressure and density. So now I have three other processes that I need to look at to see where they may be off. I go to my net standard volume. My net standard volume is nothing more than my GSV times my SW, my deduction for sediment and water. And this is typically in a percentage. I've got a sediment uh, deduction that I do through, uh, let's say doing a grind out or I've got a S and W probe that's sitting out there and uh, it's, it's giving me what the percentage of water is within the system. I'm gonna go ahead and deduct that basically as a percentage from my, net, from my gross standard volume and that's gonna give me my net standard volume. If I don't have an S and W probe, guess what? NSV should be exactly GSV. So if I'm looking at those two numbers and they're off, that means I have S&W set up somewhere. If they're way off, then I know I have a really crazy S&W value coming in. So go back, break down the calculation, we can see what's going on. Now the last thing that we're gonna calculate inside is we're gonna calculate mass. So as long as I have a, uh, a good gross volume, I'm not gonna correct for temperature or pressure. All I need to know is the density of the fluid and I calculate mass by taking the volume and multiplying it by the density. And that's gonna give me the mass of the fluid. So if I'm trying to troubleshoot the, uh, let's say the gross standard volume and I'm like, oh, what's going on here with my gross standard volume? Well, one of the first things I can look at is my mass. If my mass is not right, if my mass volume or my mass pound is not being calculated correctly, I know I have a really bad density reading. So if the density reading is wrong, that's gonna affect how the CTL and the CPL are calculated, which is gonna throw off your gross standard volume. It's gonna make that off also. 
So look at density. If density is wacky, then I know that that's going to affect GSV and NSV because they're downstream calculations. So another way of troubleshooting, and again, if I know where the numbers come from and how they're derived, I can break down the system and look and see why things are happening the way that they're happening. Now mass pulse, we can take mass pulse, and the mass pulse we're going to get, let's say, from a mass device. So I may be getting um, a mass directly off the Coriolis meter or off an ultrasonic meter, or in cases I can actually say that the, uh, the turbine meter could provide a mass, but typically we don't do that. So with mass, we have an indicated mass, which is nothing more than the pulses we set up inside the meter to say, give us 10,000 pulses per pound. And that's our K factor. The K factor is 10,000 pulses per pound. So I count my pulses divided by my K factor, and that's gonna give me my indicated mass. My actual mass then is the pulses divided by the K factor, my indicated mass, times the meter factor. Again, I'm gonna correct it because not every meter is perfect. We wanna prove these meters and derive a meter factor to determine how accurate that they are. So with this, we have a meter factor, we come up with our mass. So pretty simple. Now what happens if I wanna do volume off that mass? Well, if I wanna take that mass and turn it into volume, then I just take and do this equation. I wanna get my mass, which is the pulses divided by the K factor times the meter factor, and then I divide it by the meter density. Pretty simple math, right? When I went to indicated volume and I wanted to go to or gross volume and I wanted to go to mass, I multiply it by the, the, the density. Now I divide by the density. So if I have a problem with my indicated, if I have a problem with my indicated volume or my volume, but I'm bringing the meter in as a mass meter, the only thing that really can mess me up is either my K factor, but if my mass is coming in correct, then I know that my K factor is probably good. The only thing that can affect me is my meter density. So I got to go back and look at my meter density. Meter density is off. I can't calculate a good indicated volume. A lot of times I get calls and people say, hey, listen, um, you know, we're, we're bringing in, uh, we're bringing in uh, mass pulse, but I don't have any volume. Got to be density. See, the only thing that really affects it. So, and then from there, we take that indicated volume and we work through our equation back on volume to go ahead and uh, create our GSV and our NSV. So, that's uh, that's where we're at. Density. I put this up really big because you see a lot of the issues that we're coming into are density. Um, we are, we are looking at this density to, to try to determine uh, our corrections. So if our density is not right, nine times out of 10, the information in our flow computer is not right. A lot of people deal with API density, and uh, here's a great definition. I'm not gonna read it all to you, but basically, uh, you know, the American Petroleum Institute came up with their density. And, uh, you know, if, if the density is greater than 10, uh, it's lighter and it floats on water. If it's less than 10, it's heavy and it sinks. So what we're looking at is it's, it's a relative, basically the API gravity is an inverse measurement of density. So what that means is that if I'm looking at grams per cubic centimeter, let's say for density, and if my grams per cubic centimeter is increasing, my API density is going to decrease and vice versa. So little bit about density. We're going to do a whole thing about density, but this is how density is calculated, the API gravity. We basically are taking the specific gravity of the product, and then you can get that from, let's say, a hydrometer or a densitometer, or we're reading it off a Coriolis meter or an ultrasonic meter, and then we're doing a conversion to get it to API gravity if we're using API gravity as our input. If we have the API gravity, this is how we back gap calculate it to get to specific gravity at 60 degrees. Because again, we're trying to get to a reference. We want to get to the, the density to a reference so we can use our tables. And what are these API tables that I keep talking about? Well, a lot of smart people over the course of time have developed these correction tables based upon the properties of different fluids. 
And these tables allow us to apply factors, CTL, CPL, correction factors, to basically correct for the effects of temperature and pressure at a given density on, a, on specific liquids. And there's all kinds of tables that are out there. I'm not gonna go over all the tables. We're gonna use um, some spe a specific table in here to give an example. But take in mind that these tables have boundaries. So if I look at a specific table, let's say 5A uh, and 6A, that they can only take temperature or gravity ranges from minus 20 to 180 and temperature from minus 100 to 400, which seems like a, a pretty big swing, and it is, and pressure from minus 10 to 2,000. But when you start getting into propanes and ethanes and butanes, those pressures and those temperatures, the tables are a lot tighter, and you can actually get outside the boundaries of the table. And what that means is the equations don't go outside them. We have to extrapolate. The flow computers will start extrapolating out what that algorithm goes out to because in the old days we had a book and the book had a range of, of uh, tables and you would look and you would say well my temperature is this my pressure is this and I look down and it gives me a, a correction factor but there would be blanks in there because the blanks would be either we're outside the boundary and we don't know what it is or the products in vapor or we've gone outside too high a pressure and temperature and the algorithm hasn't run out that far and you have the ability in most flow computers to say, hey, listen, if you go outside the boundaries, the limits of what this table is, don't calculate anymore. Raise an alarm and say, I'm outside, I'm out of range on my calculations. Or we can continue extrapolating those calculations out. And that's, uh, there, there are options inside there. But each one of these tables has a boundary. You'll see in the five, uh, the five and six table that they also have letters. And those letters, reference 5A, 6B, and so forth, different fuels that you can use. Most time people are using 5A, 6A. Um, they may use the Bs for gasolines, uh, transition fluids, or, or when you're going down a pipeline, you get transmix, it may be a transition between two different fluids, going from gasoline to jet fuels, and, and you're measuring that, trans, that uh, transmix coming through there. So just the different tables that are out there, and we need to be very specific on, you don't wanna use obviously a, a table that's for propane when you're doing crude oil because the compressibility and the, the, the effects are totally different on them. So what we do is we're taking this table and we're gonna apply it. I have a density, I have a temperature, I have a pressure. And the very first thing I need to do is I need to get this density, which is let's say the flowing API gravity. So I've got the gravity of flowing conditions. This is what it's flowing at right now at the meter. I've got my observed, what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna take that flowing and I'm gonna multiply it times a density correction factor. So I may have come out and, and done a calibration on the densitometer or the hydrometer, and now I have a density correction factor and I'm gonna apply that to the API gravity. I'm gonna take the current density temperature, the current density pressure, and I'm gonna output API, or the density at 60 degrees, reference temperature and pressure. So this table with these inputs then gives me API at 60. And a lot of people think this is where I stop. And in most cases, I would stop here because the meter is at the same temperature and pressure as what the densitometer is. So if I think about a Coriolis meter, I'm getting the density a lot of times from the Coriolis meter, so it is at the same temperature and pressure. But in a lot of cases, we have densitometers hooked into lines, and they may be upstream or downstream in the meter, and they may be uh, on another part of the skid, uh, a ways away from where the meter is. So I may have uh, density pressure and density temperature, but my meter temperature and pressure are at a different, um, or at a different uh, temperature and pressure which means that really what I'm using for the correction of the liquid needs to be at the meter, not at the densitometer. So I then start coming up with what my meter density, temperature, pressure, and corrections are. And that's what I'm really concerned about. Again, if I don't have a separate temperature and pressure for the densitometer, the number is gonna be the same. The API at 60 is gonna be the same as the, uh, the API meter density. But if they are different, then we start coming into 
the correction for that. So I take now this reference, this density at 60 degrees at reference temperature and pressure, but now I need to put in the meter temperature, the meter pressure, and what I'm gonna get out of that is my meter density at the meter temperature and pressure. And that's gonna give me the CTL and the CPL that I actually used back on those equations. So again, if I'm looking through to get information on a ticket or something else like that, I do, I need the CTL and CPL, and that's gonna come from the meter density. Now, again, the meter density, if I don't have separate temperature and pressure for a densitometer, is going to be the same as the density, temperature and pressure. But there can be cases when it's different, and that's why I specifically call it out. But that's how these tables go. They make the algorithm, creates these outputs, and then this is what we use for our final corrections. Flew through a lot of information. This is all gonna be back online. As a quick reference, when you look at a flow computer, these flow rates that we're looking at indicated gross mass, gross standard, net standard. My indicated is nothing more than my pulses divided by my K factor. My gross is, I take that indicated volume, multiply it by the meter factor. Gross standard volume is, I take the gross volume, apply CTL, CPL corrections, that gives me this. And then net standard volume, I have my um, S and W deduction. And then my mass is divided, is basically my gross volume times my density. When I look at this really quickly off the bat, I can tell you right now, indicated volume, gross volume, my meter factor is a one, right? Because they're both the exact same flow rate. So I'm not applying a meter factor to it, my meter factor is a one. If I look at my gross standard volume to my net standard volume, they're the same exact number, I don't have S and W. So just looking at a few numbers, we can really quickly see a couple things that are going on inside the system. Are there, uh, are there any questions? I'm gonna look at the chat real quick. For the equation GV times CTL, so I'm CPL times LCF, what does LCF represent? I couldn't write fast enough, sorry about that. LCF is the viscosity correction. So there are meters, and, and I'll, I'll show you a configuration real quick. When I go to, let's say a meter run, and I'm setting up a uh, flow meter, uh, I can go in and, and set, uh, oh guys, let's see. I know I have a setting for this on the type of meter that it is. There it is, the viscosity correction. And a lot of times it's for helical meters or turbine meters. So we'll have this viscosity correction, LCF. And if there is an equation where the, the, a factor is created, that will be in the, uh, in the LCF. All right, well, I appreciate everybody uh, uh, joining in again. Uh, I'm gonna work on getting these videos out there. And uh, if you have any questions afterwards, again, please email them to us, give us a call. If we don't know the answers, um, we're gonna get you in touch with somebody who does know the answer and can answer those questions for you. Uh, the more questions we have, the more knowledge we can all share. And if there's specific things you would like to go over, or if you would like to be a presenter also, love to have you be able to present. Um, our lab is being uh, built up where you're actually going to be able to have equipment that we can demonstrate and hook up and whiteboards to be able to do presentations like that. So we're going to progress along in this series and just keep on going. I have a pretty aggressive schedule over the next six, six days of, uh, of videos that will be presented out. Um, there's actually a couple more questions here. Oh, just people saying thank you. And uh, I guess I really appreciate you, you guys joining on this. And... Uh, be safe out there. If uh, uh, we've got some more classes coming up tomorrow, if, uh, if uh, you want to join those and can make them, great. If not, uh, there'll be links posted up on our website and also this training uh, schedule of where they are and uh, where you can go to YouTube to see those. So be safe out there and uh, have a good day. And I'm just going to kick back on the beach here. So yeah. thanks.